So out of five options, what do you think should be the penalty for Katie? And she right. only did this for this one question. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I like this example. Uh, I feel like number hmm. Remember Katie's case study from the beginning of episode one? It turns out there are multiple ways to deal with Katie's situation, and a lot of it can be controlled by her or influenced by the instructor. For example, Katie could communicate her issue to the grader and ask for an appeal. She could do nothing and receive the penalty the grader emailed her about. Katie could speak to her instructor directly and skip communicating to the grader altogether. Hi, I'm Victoria and welcome to Cafe Creative Episode 2 of Academic Dishonesty. I had the chance to interview several award-winning faculty members and a couple of students to hear their perspectives on reducing the issue of academic dishonesty. Here's how some of our faculty and students believed Katie's situation could be handled. It's not necessarily like a grader could just magically say, no, you're excused because other students might have been cheating. I, until you said that, I did not, I did not think there was an appeal process. I thought, I mean, I figured you could probably, you could probably fight it if mm -hmm. you were wrapped up in that, mm -hmm. but I didn't know there was an entire process now. Yeah, there's a set, prof this is just for the undergrads. Uh -huh. For graduate students, there's a different procedure run through the graduate studies group, but for undergrads, um, we recommend that a, a faculty member would report the, um, let's call it an offense, the, the cheating incident to the Office of uh, Academic Support. Mm -hmm. And there's a little form you can use online, mm -hmm. um, or you could just send an email to um, the vice provost. Um, and then the student is contacted and we have them come in. The faculty member would have given me, Dr. Northcutt now, the um, kind of a summary of what happened and any evidence that they had. And then um, we talk to the student and try to figure out, you know, what's going on. And so, I mean, my guess, uh, my interpretation would be this is would be a misinterpretation by the grader. And so I would be interested in what the instructor thought of whether or not that was actually cheating or not. Right. right. But yeah, because um, the graders, that is their part of their responsibility is to flag things mm -hmm. for, for somebody else to make a, a decision on. But I in, in this case, I based on the rules that were set out, I wouldn't say that that was that was cheating right well, around academic dishonesty cases um, emotions can get really high and um, for students these things are really really important so it's I think it's a good idea just to get some get some backup and make sure you're on solid ground before you dive in with those so what are ways to get backup when I as the instructor suspect one or a group of students may be cheating and what if I have a hunch in it a lead, but I'm not 100% sure. Here's some practical processes to put in place if you believe a student or a group of your students may have resorted to academic dishonesty in your class. So just, um, you know, as I was saying earlier about how faculty shouldn't take it personally if students cheat in their classes, I think it's also really important uh, for new faculty, especially and GTAs, especially to not um, to, to get some advice, right? To, to take a cheating case to another instructor, to a mentor, to a supervisor, um, to just to get some advice about the context before they start in on some kind of exchange with the student. Because again, you can, you can make a situation so much worse by just making bad assumptions or not understanding the context or using just the wrong language, right? And you were telling me also about how sometimes faculty get um, concerned because they report someone and then that yeah. student's like back in the class. And, right. But there's a part that you guys do or within that office they do where they can't, you know, it's confidentiality. Exactly. We have been... Um, the general counsel of the University of Missouri has given advice to all, all the campuses about that, and it's considered a, um, you know, a confidential process. So we're not allowed to tell a faculty member that, hey, you sent student next to me, and here's the, um, here's the punishment that I administered. We're not allowed to give them specifics. We can say yes, we met with them, and we're working with the student. Um, but again, many faculty expect 
that that student's going to be expelled or or worse. I'm not sure what's worse. Um, <laughs> and so um, when they see them back in their classroom the next semester or they see them in somebody else's class, they're, they get very frustrated. Right. And I, all I can do is explain that we have to we have to be fair and follow due process and, um, you know, in most cases, give the students a chance and maybe even a couple of chances. Um, from a student perspective, I, I, what I don't like about it is you're going to fail at some point. You're going to have, you're going to run into these time crunches where you have to make choices and accept consequences. I don't, and what I mean by that is, Sometimes you just can't get something done and you sort of say, okay, here's how I recalibrate my goals because I've overcommitted or I have, uh, you know, or I got to find a faster way or, you know, this just has to be good enough at this point so that I can move on to other things. And those are really good lessons to learn in an environment like college because I don't want to say it's low stakes, right? Graduation is, is really, in getting through all of this, is really an accomplishment. But it's not an accomplishment of perfection. And I, I don't think it should be. I mean, I, we fail all the time in the lab. We fail. It, it, you know, there are sometimes you just can't get things done or you, you do a just good enough job. And I think those are good lessons to learn. And so rather than cheating to get through this, that learning something about yourself and how you're going to handle that and, and do it is a great life lesson for on down the road when this is going to happen. But I think it's very common amongst faculty to have incredibly high expectations of all of our students. That's not a bad thing, but those students are not necessarily going to become uh, obsessed with our topics and maybe you don't even care about them at all, just trying to get through the class. I just got done teaching this spring um, a research writing course, and, and one of the things that our department has done with that course, which is English 1160, is, um, is to ask students to choose topics that are in their majors. And so it becomes um, relevant to them quite immediately. And, and the assignments that we're asking them to do, research proposals and literature reviews and things like that, are things that they should be doing anyway frankly, and they probably will be doing those things later in their either college or real careers, but we just give them a kind of a warm up, right? So in the context of, okay, this is a hot topic in your field, you need to know more about this anyway. So now let's learn how to, how to research this and write about that. And, and, and I think our campus is a good one for, um, for thinking about those kinds of um, um, intersections, right? Educational intersections are making, making things relevant, really trying to, really trying to think about why, again, why we're teaching this thing. So what are, what are your thoughts on ways that a new faculty could reduce, you know, the possibility for cheating as they're starting their semester? Well, I'd say first thing is structure your assessments so that they're not as um, high stress, high stakes, more frequent which means more work, you gotta grade more stuff. Um, so it's kind of a balancing act there. Explain right up front, maybe more than once, to your class what your expectation is with academic um, honesty and or dishonesty, plagiarism, what your expectations are if, you have, if they are writing. Uh, don't just assume that these students know. The first step is to inform and educate. Tell students what is and is not cheating. Don't assume they know. Um, again, you're an educator, not a police officer. So um, be sure that students understand what is and isn't. Again, students get lots of mixed messages uh, every single day. You've got one faculty member saying, well, of course the test answer should be word for word and exactly like it was in the book. You need to memorize that stuff. And you've got another faculty member saying, all of this should be put into your own words. Um, if you do it word for word, then I'm gonna assume that you had your book open while you were taking the test. A lot of people don't have finals during finals week. Mm -hmm. They try to move it to the week before. Well, everybody then moves it the week before. And so now they've compressed that finals week and everything into that, you know, that the dead week, or if you have the option to move it a week off of that schedule, move it a week off of that schedule. And a lot of the times, if what students don't realize is that often, if you just go up to your professor and say, hey, I'm really swamped right now, I have something big coming up, 
can I please have an extension or some leniency or something? More often than not, I've found that they say, yeah, dude, do what you have to do. We can reconvene. Don't worry about it. Um, And that's not true for all professors, for sure. But I do think that mustering up that courage and the stress of thinking about asking that question is what holds people back from success more often Mm. than not. We've heard from the faculty perspective on some practical processes to add to the classroom to reduce confusion, stress, or even help with student learning. But what are the gaps students are noticing? Here's some thoughts from our students. But I think the optimal solution is yes, just give one problem that's similar to those trick problems. Mm -hmm. So when I go back through my notes or if I'm going back to watch the lesson, I can better identify like what to use or actually be able to recognize because sometimes I know with math, I've just looked at a problem and been like, this is a paragraph and I don't know I don't know where to start. Like, I don't know what to find, what to identify. So at least give me something that when I'm going back on it, I have something to kind of base it off of. Anything that gets students to work together uh, in a healthy way instead of just sending, hey, what'd you guys get for this answer in the group me, right? Um, like, how to help each other with the process, not just the answer, is going to be way more beneficial and will just help with cognition. Yeah. Um, yeah. And hearing it from someone else helps too. Yeah. Sometimes professors, they just keep talking and talking, and eventually you get lost. But when you have your friend telling it to you, it's a lot different. It's, it's worded differently. Um, so time in class to work together is always really nice. My main thing is time management. Maybe when students come in, during a week or something like that, there's a time management kind of crash course where teachers can kind of give tips to students or maybe even older students can try and share the knowledge that they've really acute over their time in college. Anything, any external resource can be really helpful and motivating that professors don't always have the time for. Um, What do you mean by external resource? like lead or okay. just getting a tutor the uh, the student success center has some stuff um so but, professors just kind of pointing students like we have these things right exactly yeah. um and also professors that just reiterate my office hours are here and at this time and i would love it if you stopped by that's really helpful be available for questions and know sometimes students don't know what to ask this is so big. This is, I hear so many faculty say, well, nobody asks any questions. So take yourself back to a time when you did not know what to ask. You were sitting at your desk, you didn't know what to do, and you didn't know what to ask. And for me, that moment, probably the biggest in my faculty career was the first year I was asked to do my annual review. Um, It got announced in the faculty meeting. Don't forget, everybody, your annual review dossiers are due um, in January. I didn't know what to do. And I'm sitting at my desk thinking, I've been hired as a faculty member, and I don't really know what they're talking about. And I can't ask anybody or they're going to wonder why they hired me, right? So I don't, I didn't even know the questions to ask to get myself started. Students often feel that way. We get so lost in our course content that of course that assignment makes sense to you. You have done it, you've assigned it, and you've graded it several times. This is the first time for the student looking at it. Um, So think through all of those questions, issues that students have had in the past, common mistakes that they've made, and get those answered in those transparent assignments. When it comes to assignments and assessments, can these actually play a role in significantly reducing academic dishonesty cases in your class? We'll cover this in our final episode of Academic Dishonesty, episode three. Thanks for tuning in today. And if this feels like you're drinking from a fire hose, don't worry. Our group here at CAFE is here to help with any suggestions, tips, or reminders. But one thing we do have on campus that you might not know about is we have a group of 12 award-winning faculty members who are called the Minor Master Mentors. The M3 group serves any instructors who would like advice or suggestions from experienced faculty. 
especially when it comes to navigating tricky situations like these. Having gone through the rigor themselves, M3 advisors understand that academic dishonesty is a very complex issue and every situation is unique. So check out the link below to get in contact with a minor master mentor today. I'm Victoria, and I'll see you next time for our final episode of Cafe Creative, the academic dishonesty series. <laughs>